What will your future look like? The job you do today could be different than the jobs of tomorrow. Some see this as a challenge. At UCF, we see opportunity. A chance for you to grow your knowledge and strengthen your skills from anywhere life might take you. With in-demand degree programs and resources for your success, UCF Online can help you prepare for the future and all the possibilities that come with it. From the University of Central Florida's Center for Distributed Learning, I'm Tom Cavanaugh. And I am Kelvin Thompson. And you are listening to TopCast, the teaching online podcast. Hi, Kelvin. Hey, Tom. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Here we are once again, socially distanced in the same office. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Last episode, we were, we were at home. I guess we never really commented on why. It was because there was, a, there was internet work being done in the That's office. Right. That's right. <laughs> it wasn't like there was plague or you know anything like that it was no we were just we weren't sure we could guarantee a, a good solid internet connection um, at the place where you're supposed to be able to guarantee a good solid internet connection I do appreciate more than ever a good solid internet connection as you know I do yep like a <laughs> fine wine have one <laughs> <That's right. laughs> yes yeah all right Speak so I just saw you take a sip and yeah, I have I in say. front of me what you poured from a, across the room um, yeah. I have amazing cup. dexterity that I can pour across <laughs> the room. That's true. I was just going to say, good and solid. I, I think uh, that's that's how I'll 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 tip my hand. I think that's how I would um, or, uh, qualify this this coffee. So, uh, for those who are newer to the podcast, we'll say we do frame Topcast as a collegial conversation about online teaching and learning conducted over a shared cup of coffee. So we talk about coffee a little bit at the beginning of each episode. So this coffee, Tom, that I have poured for you, and you've probably enhanced with your um, trademark froof. Yes, is, um, just a tad. <laughs> just a tad of froof. It comes to us from Bones Coffee Company in Cape Coral, Florida. You might recall we had coffee from Bones Coffee uh, not yeah. too long ago, a while back. And so this... That's the uh, southwest coast yes, of Florida. That's right, Cape Coral down uh, south Fort of Naples, I want to say. Oh, is it south uh, of Naples? I or maybe it it's north of Fort Naples. Myers-ish. Anyway, it's, it's around down there. It's yes. down that way. Okay. It's down that way. South Someone of Sarasota. Someone will correct us. Somebody at Florida Gulf Coast will I'm sure <laughs> correct us. I'm sure that's true. It's down It's down there. I don't get that down that way too often. But um, like the previous one, this also is a flavored coffee. They have other things. But I guess they seem to really uh, do a lot of flavored coffees. And, you know, I'm... I think you know this. I'm not generally a fan of flavored coffees, yes. but so far, Bones seems to do flavored coffees very well. So yeah. this flavor, you might have noticed, is a bit of a callback flavor. It's called eggnog. Is that what it is? Yes. I did detect a flavor and an aroma. I like it. Uh, it's like a nice treat here in the afternoon, um, but I, mm-hmm. I, w- I wasn't sure what it was. If, so it's eggnog. Eggnog, which is, you know, we might say uh, a bit of an anachronistic flavor at this point in the calendar. Eggnog's yeah. one of those foods that uh, kind of finds one little niche <laughs> in the in the calendar and if, hangs uh, out there. If you're still drinking your eggnog in February, it's probably Ooh. time to wrap it up. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's a problem. But eggnog flavored coffee, that's that's okay. That's mm-hmm. all right. I did so, hear somebody, uh, some I don't know who it was, some comedian or somebody that like his big hot take was eggnog all year long. You know, why should we relegate eggnog to the to the just the month and a half that it's available. That's it's a good question. Mm-hmm. I guess you could make your own. I, I I suppose, but I don't think most people make homemade eggnog. We we at least start even if it's doctored. We at least start with the store bought stuff. I think for the yeah, most part, probably maybe some of our friends in the upper Midwest that just seems like they would do something like yeah, that. That's possible. They'll that's bring possible. a hot dish. And some homemade eggnog, don't you know? Hot dish, dish, yes. So I'll ask uh, what you think of the the coffee overall, and uh, can you... I'm going to just go ahead and tell you, this is not like the best connection I've ever made, right? Really? But it's not. But it seems can you find a connection to today's yes, topic? Yes, I can, which oh, means it's amazing. a good one for me. Um, yeah, you know how I like it to be completely obvious 
you know, like if we're if we're interviewing somebody, the coffee happens to have the same name as that person. Like, oh, I get it. Uh, yeah, because Tom's so dense, he can't see the symbolism here. <laughs> but no, I get it. Um, I like the coffee. Um, it is a bit of a dessert for me right now, maybe because yeah. some of my fruit I put in there. But it, yeah. yeah, it's uh, it's a, a little bit of a treat. I don't know if I could drink a lot of it. It's kind of rich, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, but the the connection. I'm going to presume is the uh, callback, right? Yes. Because we are revisiting a topic from uh, from the somewhat recent to mid past. Yes, that's that's that, yes, that yes. is that is that is ding, great. Ding ding Tom, ding, what ding, do you ding. win? Tell him what that he is, wins, Johnny. That's right. You win yeah. uh, the rest of this episode. <laughs> <laughs> A new car! <laughs> yeah, okay, cool. Nope, the rest of this episode. We, you know, we've, I think we've, we've talked about things, we've kind of spiral curriculumed our way through topics before, but this one is a little bit of an unusual episode because we're, we're going to actually truly revisit a prior episode and see how well that episode has aged now in the COVID era and discuss how we agree or differ today with the perspective in the original episode. So you want to tell us about the earlier episode? Yeah, so um, we're, we're going to go back, uh, back to the, the distant past of in the before times. The before times. Of 2018. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it, that was episode 42. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I don't know. Should we? Should yeah? I guess we should say what the title was and everything. Sure. It was um, it was designing for synchronous online learning. Yep. And that was in October of 2018. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess nearly a year and a half uh, before the the big giant Oklahoma Sooner sand, land rush <laughs> for uh, remote instruction uh -huh. that was caused by COVID 19. Yeah. Um, and so as today's episode uh, releases, the one we're doing now, it's been almost a year since uh, American higher education uh, got turned on its head and, and uh, reached for Zoom and, and Teams and WebEx and every other synchronous video platform. Can you imagine, can you imagine that it's, it's been like... A year. Almost a year? Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, it doesn't feel like it, but it sure has. In other yeah. ways, it feels like it's been a 10. You know? Yeah, I, it, I'm with you. Catch on. me on the right day. I'm with you on that. So, uh, if you if you haven't listened to episode 42 or have it memorized, like what's wrong with you? <laughs> but um, maybe this would be a good time to maybe just press pause on this one and and go back and and listen to that one. Although you don't have to, um, yeah. we'll try and catch catch you up. But it, it might be worthwhile as sort of a, a way to kind of uh, compare and contrast how things maybe have changed for you in your own context at your institution. Um, because they have changed here, that's for sure, and um, and so we're gonna we're gonna revisit the whole concept of synchronous learning, mm -hmm. and, in, and in light of in light of um, our COVID experience, exactly, yeah, and how it's changed um, yeah. in the past year, and then maybe a little bit of how we see it changing going forward uh, yes. uh, after this this year, <laughs> in the after times. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I feel like I should I should shift every time you're you, you know, <laughs> title case all of these things. You know, yeah, the before it's like times, a, like a, a Mad Max times. movie or something. Like it does sort of feel everything membered, everything marked in, in the after times from the before times. Yeah, wow, okay, that's exactly it. So you should find uh, for our listeners here, you should find the link to episode forty two within the metadata for this episode recording, uh, or directly on the Topcast website, which is topcast.online.ucf.edu. So we're going to wait for you to pause, to listen, and to return. Seriously, we're going to wait. And we're back. We're done waiting. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I feel about COVID. I uh, know. <laughs> we're done. We're, we're done, done waiting. Done. Yes. Fast forward, so, we're done. Yeah. All right, so Kelvin, you and I have listened to it. And yes, have yes. had a chance to kind of uh, reflect on, um, oh, how naive we were <laughs> <laughs> a year and a half ago, uh, or, or more than that, uh, two, two and a half, right? Yeah, as this yeah. as this episode releases, yeah, yeah, yeah. just about um, pretty close. So, um, do you have some initial reflections on? Uh, well, maybe, maybe I'll ask you first, big picture. How well did that episode 
back then age to your today ears in light of COVID-19 and our experience with synchronous remote instruction? I mean, we'll get into some specifics, but generally speaking, did you feel like, oh my gosh, that is such a before times thing? Or was it like, well, no, I, I can, there's still some relevance. No, I actually thought it was still relevant because we did, we, we kind of, our, our conversation <laughs> meandered a bit as mm. it tends to do, long as time listeners will know. Mm. Um, we talked a, a bit about blended learning and some mm -hmm. and some uh, uh, like point to point synchronous, mm -hmm. like not using Zoom kind of technologies, more like media site kinds of things. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, we we did talk about HyFlex and yeah, you, weirdly enough, right? Yeah, you went into quite an explanation of HyFlex. That yeah, seems a little bit pressure. Quite an explanation. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, which we ended up talking about again later, uh, post COVID, yes. after it had started. Um, and, and the principles, I think, that we talked about remained the same. Uh -huh. um, so we did talk about intentionality, about mm -hmm. the need for good design. I, even in a synchronous course, it's not just show up and do what you have always done. It does take right. some thought and some instructional design and some pedagogy. And I think all of that is true now. And I think maybe one other reflection is that despite the ubiquity of synchronous remote instruction that we are all doing, Mm -hmm. that maybe we hadn't really been doing before. Um, I think the, the preference is still the well-designed asynchronous online experience. Tell us um, why, Tom. Because it's intentional and it's designed and it, it's, it's set up to take full advantage of the modality and the medium. So, for example, you know, you could link out to, uh, to web research and to uh, online games and to articles and to um, videos and other kinds of things that it's very difficult to do in real time. It, it really, the, the format of synchronous instruction, particularly, and we can talk, we'll, we'll talk about this in a little bit, through the, this particular platform mm -hmm. of, of a meeting platform. It's, it's optimized mm -hmm. to be a meeting platform, not an instructional platform. It forces you into certain kinds of instructional strategies. It, it mm -hmm. sort of forces you into a lecture first strategy. And that's just what it's designed to do. It's designed to have people talk at other people or with other people. And um, that uh, doesn't always make for the most interactive engaging if it's not well designed and intentional. Yeah. Soapbox. I'll get off my soapbox now. No, I, I think all that's all that's right. Um, I think one thing that was uh, true of us when this episode released in 2018 that is different of us today, and and I suspect um, that the um, comparison will hold with a number um, of our listeners from their institutional context, but not all, is back then, we really only had informal, I think we used the metaphor, island in the ocean, informal synchronous prior to the pandemic. Right. Now- well, Supplemental, yeah. Yes, that's right. Just, we gave several examples, but now we have many, <laughs> all faculty and students who have experienced whole synchronous courses for multiple semesters. Now, I'm not going to go so far as to say that all of them have had experience with when well designed, mm -hmm. uh, to pull a phrase out of our colleague Shannon Riggs, um, great book, Thrive Online, which if you haven't read, you should read. That's, that's, her, that's her phrase that she uses a lot, like when designed well, you know, online is just as good or better than face-to-face -face or anything else. But so when designed well really should be our, our emblazoned upon us right. uh, for all of our teaching and learning. It's not always, but uh, yeah. we certainly well, have I a mean, lot more people. It's true regardless of modality. Face-to-face -face classes can can suck too, right? That's right. <laughs> you know, that's right. If they're designed well, then they don't. And it's that's the right. same in online. It's the same with synchronous online, you know, that's right. across the board. That is right. And, and like you said, we also, we did, as you say, meander and we talked about some derivations. And back then we did have some particular uh, things bubbling up where there were some, like you said, classroom to classroom kinds of uh, synchronous video. But I suspect that as we look forward now into the future, I think that we're 
We've said previously that we're going to have more synchronous going forward than we've had in the past. I think that's true. But the, the kind of synchronous we're likely to have more of going forward is more of that, for lack of a better term, multi-point, you know, zoom from wherever uh, at a certain time. I think that's the kind of synchronous we're talking about. Yeah, so we, we've mentioned this before, especially during our field reports, but I, I have, a, uh, and, I, and I think you've, you, you agree, that an opinion that one of the, the lingering after effects of, of our giant experiment with ins remote instruction is that uh, we will continue doing synchronous learning uh, online to some degree, uh, you know, in the after times. <laughs> and um, how can we do that well? And how can we ensure that we do it at the same quality, with the same preparation, with the same assessment that uh, with, that we do our asynchronous online uh, instruction? Mm -hmm. So maybe that's a good transition to talk about what what we're doing um, on that front. So um, you know, you and I have talked, and we want to um, uh, engage our faculty mm -hmm. in having that conversation about what does synchronous learning look like at UCF post COVID-19 pandemic? Mm -hmm. And how can we, how can we uh, take advantage of their perspective to, um, to come up with a, a forward looking plan? Yeah, no, that's right. So we have commissioned a faculty group as, as we are recording this, I don't yet know who's gonna be in that faculty group. The, the window has closed and the selection process has begun, uh, and I'm not privy to it. Um, but we're gonna have a little group of, of um, 10 faculty with some modest funding, uh, with some facilitation um, jointly between our Center for Distributed Learning and our Faculty Center for Teaching and Learning to have some folks take a deep dive at the burgeoning literature related to synchronous video, online teaching, um, reflect on their own personal experiences with that and really help us um, make some recommendations that help us going forward very thoughtfully. Um, I've get asked them for five deliverables, basically, and they're going to pull those five together into one, one written document. First, with um, some benefits now and later, is some sort of an articulation of uh, what we might call good practices for synchronous online teaching. Um, you know, you find that in dribs and drabs, but, you know, to have that group thoughtfully say, this is good, this is less good. Here's, you know, you want to do the good. And so that'll be useful as long as the COVID response um, lasts and um, the post-COVID orientation, which is which right. is their focus. Well, Secondly, and, yeah, and beyond. I mean, that, that beyond. is the key. That's right. Yeah. That's correct. And, um, Secondly, and fundamentally, you know, kind of the big question, should our university do something formal with synchronous online teaching in the after times, you know, post COVID? And uh, I suspect the answer is going to be yes. It's, we have to be open to them saying no. I, I think we'll want to hear why. Um, but something formal like standalone, which we didn't do here at our institution uh, pre-COVID. Uh, so we want to hear, would you recommend that? And if the answer is yes, then there's several other questions that, um, that bubble up from there. Like, okay, how do our existing structures and models need to accommodate that new formalized synchronous uh, online teaching? Should it be a standalone modality? Should it be should there be several modalities? Is it, um, is, it, is, it, is it really no, it shouldn't be a standalone, it should only be um, something that exists within an existing modality? Like, um, uh, you know, there's only video courses, but some of them can be synchronous, you know, is it like that? Or a portion um, of them could be synchronous. A portion of them, that's yeah. right. Um, well, and if, the, and if that, regarding that particular deliverable, if that, um, if that group comes back and says, no, don't think we should have synchronous strategy for the university, I, I think we're going to have to engage deeper on that because... Absolutely. What do I do with um, a department that shows that's up right. and sa to me and says, uh, we're doing it, Tom, mm -hmm. um, okay, okay. Uh, what, what guardrails of quality do I have to kind of enforce the, the best practices? That, that's exactly right. And that's got to be part of the dialogue, right, is to, is to let this group know that we're anticipating 
some of that demand. So what would you suggest, you know, in yeah. instead of, or how do you make this work well? Um, fourthly, I think um, we're beginning to see some emerging synchronous online teaching learning platforms, not just, you said earlier, we've kind of co-opted existing video conferencing platforms for this remote instruction uh, period, but we're beginning to see some uh, built for this platforms emerge. And so we've worked out some access. So this group will be able to kick the tires, take a look and see if they would recommend one of these or, or not. Like maybe they see, oh yes, the built for it really makes a difference. That helps, helps support the when designed well kind of thing. It helps, them, it makes it to, uh, to quote our previous um, uh, two episodes ago, helps people do the right thing. But if it doesn't, then maybe it's more about just uh, using one of these uh, blank canvas, um, no pun intended, uh, video web conferencing platforms like Teams or WebEx or Zoom or whatever. And then finally, there's got to be some consideration of, of um, faculty preparation. Like, okay, thoughtfully now having thought about what's really good synchronous online teaching and how this all plays out, what kind of preparation do our UCF faculty need in order to make that happen. So that has implications for faculty development and related to that because we we couple together faculty development with uh, longer term impact evaluation. We'll talk about impact evaluation a little bit too. So I can't wait to see what they come up with, except that we can't wait to see. <laughs> to see what they come up with. Well, so you want I mean, to talk about that? You've given them a, a well, you've given them a, a deadline of the end of the spring semester Correct. to come back with some answers. But you're right. Uh, some events have overtaken us uh, in the in the meantime. So for example, we have some colleges that want to do particular things in the fall, and we need to have some resolution at least on how to label mm -hmm. those things in our student information system. Um, if nothing else, at least at a minimum, because registration starts in March. And, and we have three semester, three term registration. Mm -hmm. So they're building the next three terms for those students of you know, summer, fall, and spring. Uh, so for example, one of the things that they've come to us with is that for one of our video modalities, where you can have up to 20% of the instruction face-to-face, mm -hmm. -face, it gives them some flexibility to do partial blended. The, the result of, um, of COVID has been that um, they want to do that. They want to have um, some face-to-face some -face experience, but they want the <laughs> online portion of it, which has always been asynchronous, mm -hmm. to now be a live synchronous session with Zoom. Like, okay, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. And I understand why they want to do that, but we've never we've never done that before. So we don't have a code for it to communicate to students what the expectations are. And then the fact that if they sign up for one of these courses, uh, they're going to have to be online at a certain time on a certain day every week or several days every week, whatever the schedule might be. And and I, I'm really uh, hyper-focused on making sure that students are absolutely aware of what they're signing up for mm -hmm. because they've got Agreed. work schedules and families and everything else, and, and I think it's only fair to them. So we're having that conversation right now. So maybe by the time this actually is released, it, we'll have some idea of well, at least what we're doing for fall. My hope, though, is what we figure out for fall will be... Uh, the answer going forward, because I'd hate to have to do two things, but we'll do what makes sense. Yeah, it, it's challenging. Uh, you know, the way I keep thinking of it is, um, let's say that we were, let's hope not, but let's say for the sake of conversation that we're still in some form of remote instruction for the fall. Heretofore, we at UCF have not charged a distance learning course fee for ad hoc remote instruction courses. We've tried to do a little bit better every semester. We've tried to do a little bit better preparation, but we've not charged that. And I think if we didn't do anything else, I, th I think what we'd want to do is sort of make what was synchronous remote instruction officially synchronous online teaching. Um, I think which would be a real modality with, that actually charges a distance learning course fee, has a bit more 
guardrails in place for faculty preparation and, and evaluation and, and support and, and so forth, and not so ad hoc. I think right. at the very least we'd want to do that. Now, I'm hoping we're not in as much of a remote instruction situation in the fall, uh, in which case, uh, by default, what was remote instruction would go back to some version of face-to-face. -face. Right. And then it's a question of do uh, colleges or departments want to continue to offer some kind of online that's palatable to them, i.e. synchronous online? Well, you know, based upon the predicted vaccination schedule, um, uh, you know, we'll see what the future holds. But um, based on that, I, I think it's a reasonable un assumption that fall will be back to some level of more normal, um, knock on wood. Knock on wood. Yeah, yeah, so, let's hope so. you, know, we'll you did make a, a, a passing point that I just want to underscore because I thought it was a good one. Um, whatever we do, we've got to be really clear with students because to do otherwise uh, sort of de facto bait and switches them, right? You don't want right. to, if students are thinking, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to have an online experience so that I can fit my coursework into my you know, adult responsibilities, and then they find out that they've got to be, you know, three nights a week or three afternoons a week uh, at a certain time, uh, right here, you know, looking into the, the web camera, um, that's different, right? right. So we got to be really clear. And it's not just clear with students, it's clear with our college and department uh, contacts as well. Everybody's super clear. The more complicated this is, in some ways, the harder to communicate about it yeah and and coming up with uh, with make sure making sure that we have um, very uh, standard uh, processes and procedures mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, around how how that gets captured so I think we learned a lesson this summer and fall uh, from our blendflex uh, experience where we the only way we coded that a course was blendflex it was actually in the course notes. And yeah. despite <laughs> our attempts to provide standardized language for those course notes, it wasn't always used. No. So to this day, maybe this is us admitting more than we should in a public podcast, but to this day, I'm not sure we know exactly how many courses use BlendFlex. I think we, we've got a pretty good sense because we've, we've come up with all the different possible keywords and searched for them. In the, but that's no way no. To, to, you know, plan for a, a, an ongoing sustaining modality. Yeah. Now, BlendFlex was just a stopgap. It's not something that we plan to do permanently. But I think synchronous instruction, as I've said, I think is going to stick around for a while. And so yep. we need to come up with a sustainable, scalable data solution, like a, you know, a meta-tagging solution for this. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that's probably a good place to leave it, too. You want to try to put this plane down on the runway? Sure. So uh, I think you and I would both say it's safe to say that the, the global pandemic will leave behind changes mm. in what we do and how we do it. Mm -hmm. And as we anticipate the aftertimes of a post-COVID <laughs> era uh, as soon as possible, soon uh, as possible. the purpose and practices of synchronous online teaching and learning uh, will likely be renewed and more relevant than ever before. Yeah, I agree with that. I think it makes sense. We'll, we'll be feeling our way a little bit, but mm -hmm. um, I think we know kind of what to, generally what to anticipate and kind of at least what questions to ask and, and what the, the areas are that we're going to have to address between here and there. Yep. So, you know, we'll, we'll maybe we'll check back in on this topic in the after times. May it, may <laughs> Thank they you get for here the, soon. Uh, the eggnog coffee. Yeah, I kind of like it. You know, it's a... Uh, it, maybe that is a way of having eggnog that's not spoiled uh, even in the summer if you were drinking. I don't know how often they make <laughs> well, it. Well, at the, the risk of coming across as some sort of uh, alcohol, uh, somebody with an alcohol problem, I, like I've said it more than once, that sometimes the coffee you give me would be good with a nice splash. <laughs> this is that. one of those, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Um, we have time for just a quick plug, you think? Let's do it. Um, I think we plugged this a while back. We... We had a, a posting, a job posting, uh, a few months ago um, that we have now tweaked. We, uh, we, we did fail the search, um, and we have tweaked the, the requirements of that, and we have now reposted it for a director of instructional design that oversees our 
um, 20 plus faculty instructional designers. It is a great position. Uh, and we really want everybody to know about it. So whether it's you, dear listener, or whether it's somebody you know, would you take a look at this? We'll put it in the show notes, but if you, if you have a pencil, uh, here is a bit.ly link, bit.ly slash DID posting. That is DID, Director of Instructional Design, bit.ly slash DID posting, lowercase no spaces. Yeah, so just maybe I'll, I'll uh, underscore that. Uh, one uh, is that um, I, I think that maybe we um, didn't quite capture the job description exactly as as we had intended, and so that's yep. sort of on us in the in the original job posting. But yep. I think we've adjusted and corrected that. And the second so. is that um, this is a key leadership position for it us. Is. This is the person who oversees our entire instructional design team, and that is... Uh, the the team at the center of the bullseye for us of the I think uh, award winning nationally leading uh, uh, online learning work that that we do I I I try to say objective but it's it's hard because I I honestly think this is one of the best places in the country to work if you're in online learning in higher ed. Um, there, there aren't very many places uh, better than UCF to come. And if, and if you think you can be <laughs> the, uh, the director of instructional design, we want to hear from you. Absolutely. Or share it with a colleague, that, you know, share it widely. Uh, we love more folks rather than less folks uh, applying. Um, that's all I got. Yeah, me too. Yeah, we, and if you do apply, we look forward to, uh, to seeing it. Mm-hmm. Cool. So, um, That's probably enough for today, Kelvin. Mm -hmm. Until next time, for TopCast, I'm Tom. I'm Kelvin. See ya.